Dear Lord, I ask your blessings on Pastor Keith as he comes forward to present your message this morning, the one that you have prepared and, and shared with him to share with us. And Lord, I just ask that we will have open hearts and open eyes and minds to the message to be received and that we will um, just see things in an absolutely new and fresh way. And so, Lord, just be with him as he comes to deliver the message this morning uh, with clarity of thought and mind and uh, just prepare that message and deliver it that has come from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. Pastor Mike is uh, at annual conference with some of our other members, and that's where all the Methodists gather together, and the pastors and elders and everything gather together and and, uh, worship together and uh, discuss how we move forward in the ministry of the church and and have a great time. I got a text from Mike the same time Vicki did. We were ready to pray. Our phones went off at the same time. We're like, big brother is watching. Um, And he, he just wanted to say, you know, he always says this to me before, when he's gone, he says, he says, go preach this morning and knock them alive. I said, well, I don't think we have to worry about that with this group this morning. You guys always seem to have plenty of life in you when we gather together to worship and singing those songs together with you guys. It's, it, it brings us life and it, it, it reminds us what it's going to be like when we get to rejoice with Jesus, when we all seem together, all the, the frustrations and pain of this world will be behind us and we'll come together and rejoice and shout with, with God the victory. I, I love that, that, uh, that old hymn. Well, this morning uh, we're going to be talking about more of our, our sermon series called Should I Join, which is basically the deeper, mem- the deeper meaning behind church membership. And the reason why we're doing this is because we, we want everything that we do here at the church to have as much meaning as we can. And of course, membership as we are restructuring our discipleship pathway and some of our ministries uh, this summer and into the fall, we're changing how we do membership here a little bit at the church. And one of the things that's happening with membership is we are moving membership a little bit farther down the line in the process by which a person uh, becomes part of this church. In the past, it's been that when a person comes to the church and they begin to ask more questions about, well, I want to know more about the church, we would then point them to a new member class. And they would go to that class, and then there they'd learn the, the information about the church and, and, and then have an opportunity to join. Well, <clears throat> as we've been looking at, at, our, our, at our structure, we've decided that really, you know, when a person joins the church, they're making some pretty heavy promises. They're making some pretty heavy commitments to the church, and, and we want to make sure that people understand what this church is all about and feel like this is where they want to lay down roots and really make... Uh, a home for themselves spiritually. So what we've invited people to do is, you know, wait a little bit before you talk about membership. So now we have gatherings called Newcomer Orientations, and there'll be one at the end of, of, uh, of June as well. They happen at 11 o'clock in the uh, adult library, and it's an opportunity for a, a, a new person to come in and meet the staff and, and learn some basic information about what's going on in the church and find out where they might want to to get involved and plug in because you can still be as involved as you're, you know, whether you're a member or not. It, the, the, the membership, though, however, is for folks who've stood publicly and said, this is where I want to be involved, this is where I want my spiritual home to be, and this is where I'm going to make my, my commitment. So in order to do that, we want to walk folks through the promises that we make when we join the church to understand and make it more deep of a commitment. And that's why we're doing this. So should I join, really is for folks who are, are thinking about joining the church, but it's also for those of us who are members of the church to take a, a new look at our own membership vows and to say, okay, where am I, where am I living this out faithfully and where do I need to, to, to grow in my understanding of it? Well, today we're talking about the, the section of, of the, the vow where it says to faithfully participate in, the, in its ministries by their prayers, their presence, their gifts, their service, and their witness. Well, last week, Pastor Mike talked to you about the promise that you make to pray for your church. And I I hope that you've prayed for your church this week. I hope that you've prayed for for, for us and for the ministry of the church. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to say it's working. Because we've got some amazing things that that have been happening just in this last week. You know, Vacation Bible School is coming up. It's going to start on the 16th. 
and we have like record-breaking numbers of little kids that are coming to Vacation Bible School. We're, almost, we're up to almost 200 little kids going to be here. Yeah, it's going to be incredible. I know. <clears throat> we also started Fly on Thursday. We added two new sites in, in South Marion, which is an area that we're really trying to, to increase. And we saw 60 more lunches served the first day of Fly this year than we did the last, uh, last year's first day of Fly. We've seen growth across the board with that. It's exciting. We've got record numbers of kids signing up for Summer Games University. We're at almost 500 students already. That was our goal for last year, and we just made it at the very end. We're already, we're already almost past that. We've got five people getting ready to go back to Haiti in, at the end of July. It's exciting to see what God is doing. The, the, the ministry of the church and the mission that God has given us, it, it's happening and it's, it's exciting, isn't it? And I'm going to say it's because you all prayed this week, right? So keep it up with your prayers. Well, today I want to focus in on, on the promise that we make to faithfully participate through our presence through being here. And I know you've, you, we've all heard the phrase preaching to the choir. That's literally what I'm doing today because we all just sang and you're all here. <clears throat> so I could just high five every one of you and say, good job. We're out of here, right? <clears throat> but then, of course, you'd say, hey, Keith, we, you know, <clears throat> that's, that, that's, we, you know, we want our money's worth, right? <clears throat> and I say, well, if you don't like it, just, you know, whatever you paid, you can have it back, right? But uh, the fact is this, we make this, we make this promise that will be faithful in our presence. Now, I showed you the numbers a few weeks ago about where we are official membership-wise, which is around 2,200, and where we are about every week in terms of worship attendance, which is about 700, okay? Now, I know folks are coming here and there and going back and forth. We have an active membership in this church of about 1,400 people. So we're still about 1,000 light on our membership in terms of who actually comes to church. <clears throat> now, you're here, so good job. Okay, so I'm going to talk just for a few minutes about what that means to be in church and why that's important. And hopefully that will, you know, solidify your understanding of that. And, and maybe people out there on the, the interwebs are watching and they'll, they'll, they'll decide to, to, you know, get off the couch or the computer and actually come and join us. Wouldn't that be nice, right? And, and come and be a part of what God's doing here. And then we're going to talk for a few minutes about this scripture from John where Jesus talks about what it means to abide. Because it's not just enough to to. to be a, a, a person who's just physically in church, right? There's a lot more to be faithfully present than just sitting in a pew, and we'll talk about that too. But I want to share with you guys a verse from Hebrews that, that I think sets the stage for, for this talk this morning. Now, when the writer of Hebrews wrote these words, they were writing in a time where there wasn't a church like this. There weren't churches on every corner, and it wasn't socially acceptable to come together and sing hymns about the risen Savior Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, it was illegal to do so. And men and women and children, by the hundreds and by the thousands, were imprisoned, were arrested, and some were martyred for their public gathering of worship. But nevertheless, the writer of Hebrews writes these words in chapter 10, verse 25, And let us not <clears throat> neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of His return is drawing near. <clears throat> now, whose return? Jesus. See, they were already talking about Jesus coming back 2,000 years ago. So if Jesus, 2,000 years later, we're still waiting, we're that much more near to Jesus. I was in a Bible study one time with a bunch of high school students, and of course kids like to talk about that kind of stuff, and they wanted to know when Jesus was coming back, as if I knew the answer to that question. And I said, you know, the Bible doesn't really tell us when Jesus is coming back or, or, or when those events will take place, but we're to live faithfully as, as believers now, believing that at any moment he could return. <clears throat> and this one particular young woman, she, she was so excited about that. She said, she said, Pastor Keith, it just occurred to me, you guys, we are closer now to Jesus returning than we've ever been. <clears throat> Don't you just love the... the, the the, the excitement of, of youth, I just love that. I'm like, you are 100% right. But he says, let us not neglect our gathering together. He says, there's, there's value and there's, there's importance to coming together to worship the living God. And, and, and we as believers, we shouldn't neglect that. We shouldn't put that aside. We shouldn't say, oh, that's not important. We're faithful in our presence. 
Now, why faithfully coming to church is important, I've got four things I want to share with you about that. And, and this, is, this is along the lines of just reaffirming this in you, but maybe for helping you in your conversations with others, or, or, or maybe you're sort of on the fence about this. Well, I think there are, there are some important things we can, we can discuss because <clears throat> as members, this is what we promise to do. First and foremost, you were created to worship. And when we come together, that's what we're doing. This is a worship service where we worship the living God. And in doing so, in these moments, we are more living into our identity as human beings than at any other moment in our lives. Because this is why we're, we were created. We were created to worship. And all you have to do is look into society and see that. Because human beings, whether they claim to be Christians, whether they claim to be atheists, or whether they claim to be agnostic, or any other category we put ourselves on, human beings worship. The question is, who or what? We were created to worship. And coming to church faithfully on Sunday mornings fulfills that desire that God has put within us and allows us to experience that which we were made to do. You see, we were created for that. We were created for God's purposes, to glorify God and to worship God. And when we fail in that task, it's inevitable that our worship will go somewhere else. I mean, look at how human beings worship. We worship celebrities, don't we? We hang on their every word and on their every movement. Go to the grocery store when you're standing in line. Look at those magazines, right? You, can, you know what so-and-so had for breakfast yesterday, and people actually care about that, right? Top stories of the news. What so-and-so did at their wedding reception, or what this person is going to do on their vacation, or whatever. And it's like, okay, society worships its gods. We worship our sports teams. Some people in here worship the Cyclones. Right? <laughs> Pastor Mike is gone. <clears throat> He's watching. Some worship the Hawkeyes. Right? <laughs> Some worship the, the UNI Panthers. Right? A little, you know, <laughs> I went to UNI for a year. It was a glorious year. And uh, <clears throat> we always were getting the shaft on the whole excitement from Iowa. You know, we, we, we were like the middle children of the state. Anyway, um, we, we all worship something or someone. And when we don't worship God, it's invariable that we'll worship something else. So in coming to church faithfully, it points our worship in the right place. It points our worship in the right place toward Jesus Christ. The second thing why faithfully coming to church is important is for biblical instruction. We, we need to come together to be, to be growing and learning in our understanding of the Scriptures. And, and that's, that's what church helps us to do when we worship God. Jesus said, love the Lord God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, right? And we grow in our understanding in our minds when we read the Scriptures and we, we learn more and we grow and we're, we're, we're learning. <clears throat> that's a great benefit to coming to church every Sunday. You say, well, not every Sunday, Pastor Keith. Some weeks, not so good. But anyway... We do our best to try to teach you biblical instruction and to, to help us grow, you know, and we have also Sunday school and different, different opportunities for us to grow, and when we faithfully participate in those things, we grow in our biblical understanding and knowledge. Thirdly, faithfully coming to church is important because everybody needs community. Everybody needs community. We, we need each other, you know, and you might say, well, I don't know. I don't feel like I need somebody. Well, you know what? Somebody might need you. Sometimes you coming to church isn't about you. Sometimes you coming to church is about the person that's sitting next to you that needs someone to, to reach out to them. Sometimes you coming to church is, is about what you can do to support, what you can do to help, and what you can do to bless others. And what, you've, what you discover is that when you bless others, then you in turn are blessed. See, we all need community. Christianity is not a, a religion for lone rangers. We experience Christ in community. And that's what coming to church faithfully helps us to do. It's hard to have that community if you show up once every six months. It's hard to have that community if you're very sporadic and, and, and off and on when it comes to being in church. But when, when you've established yourself, when you've faithfully committed to being present, then it becomes much more easy to find that community, which the world is so desperate for. We need community. And coming to church faithfully each week provides that. And then fourthly, 
Faithfully coming to church is important because it establishes priorities for your family. It establishes those priorities. You know, the Israelites, when they, when they were delivered from slavery out of Egypt, they crossed over into the, into, uh, the, uh, crossed the Red Sea into the desert and were headed toward the promised land. And boy, they sure struggled, didn't they? Because talk about created to worship. They, they came from a land of, of idols and false gods in Egypt. And that was the environment they lived in. And that was the way that they saw uh, religion played out. So, of course, they felt like that's what they needed to, even though God had provided all these miracles to save them and to set them free. Once they got out of that, how quickly they forgot what the Lord God had done to deliver them. So as Moses was going high on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, Aaron, Moses' brother, was there and the Hebrews came to him and demanded that he fashion for them a God that they could worship. So they took all of their gold, gave it to Aaron, he smelted it down, and you know the story. He fashioned a calf out of the gold. And when Moses came down from the mountain carrying the tablets that had been written by the finger of God himself, he saw this pagan worship service gathered together and he was so furious that he smashed those tablets see the Israelites quickly realized that they were people who needed to worship but they were worshiping the wrong thing and as they continued to struggle over the years a young man named Joshua became the next leader after Moses and as they moved through the, the, the desert from one nation to another nation, they were surrounded <clears throat> by all of these other nations with all of their false gods and all of their idols. And that was the culture in which they lived. And it was difficult for them to maintain their fidelity to the living God. They were so inclined to go astray and, and worship the false gods. And Joshua knew that a moment was coming and it needed to be a decisive moment. So he asked them to make a choice. And he called the people together. And in Joshua 24, 15, he said these words to a people in a land of false gods. He said, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now when you establish this priority for your family that you're going to be in church faithfully, you are making that stand in a land of false gods and false idols. We live in a culture and society just as pagan and just as godless as the Hebrews did. We have idols all around us that tell us that worshiping God is not important. And when you and I make a choice to faithfully participate in church, we are choosing to serve the living God. And that's important because we can't, we can't forfeit that choice. We can't act like it's not ours to make. And too often in our lives, we want to blame others for the way things are. We want to say things like, well, it's not my choice. I didn't have a choice on what else is happening in the world on Sunday mornings. That was, I didn't pick that. No, you have to make the choice on what you're going to do and what your family's going to do. I don't get to say as a dad and as a husband, well, sorry, I, I didn't have a choice. We can't worship the living God on Sunday morning not my choice. I have the choice. You have the choice. We all have that choice. And what Joshua was saying was, look, you got to choose. Make a decision. If, if you don't want to serve the God of, of, of Abraham and Isaac and, and, and Isaac and Jacob, if you don't want to serve that God, if you want to go serve some other God, then, then go do it. If you want to go and, and fulfill every desire you have and go do what everybody else is doing, th then go do it. But as for me and my house, here's what I'm going to do. And when you join the church and you stand up before this congregation or any congregation and you say, I will faithfully participate in its ministries through my prayers and my presence, you are saying, as for me and my house, 
we will faithfully serve the Lord. And we'll be here. Now, if you were to come on a Wednesday night to our 412 ministry, you're going to see kids that are involved in every kind of activity that you can imagine. Kids with jobs, kids in band, kids in show choir, kids in sports, kids in soccer, kids kids in cheerleading, kids with every single thing. And I'm sure if you look around this, I see you guys are busy people. I see kids. the people that come to this church are are busy people. And my point is, you can make that choice. It doesn't mean you have to hide yourself in the church and never come out and never participate in anything that you want to do in the world. It doesn't mean that. But you have to make a choice on how you're going to do it. And that's your choice to make. And when you, when you decide to come to church and be faithful in that, you're establishing that priority for your family. And I think that's of incredible value. It's of incredible value. Because once it's established, it becomes just the way it is, right? You've heard Pastor Mike talk about that. Do things three times, and that's the way we've always done it, right? So make being in church faithfully the thing that you always do. And watch what happens in your family. But decide to just, you know, let it go and never think about it, and watch what happens too. It makes it so much more easy to follow God when you've already established that priority of what's the most important and what are we going to do. Now, Sometimes we find ourselves here, but we're not really here. You know what I mean? Somebody do this to somebody if they're not really here right now, right? I mean, I've been places where I've been physically present, but mentally checked out, okay? I have a daughter who is, who is in dance, okay? Have you ever been to those dance recitals? They're like nine years long, and your kid's only in for like 30 seconds, and you have to sit there the whole time, right? <clears throat> you know, I, I've been involved in that kind of stuff. Those things are only second to like karate tournaments, Okay? Because those things last even longer. And, and you know, they're, they're fun. But you can find yourself, if your kid's not the one up there dancing or singing or doing whatever they're doing or playing their thing or whatever, then you're just like, okay, I'm checked out. Right? Have you ever had a conversation with someone where you were talking and they were going like this? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's nice. But they were not listening to you at all. You could tell they were present. That happens to me sometimes. My wife will be talking to me and I'll be just be like, uh, and she'll be like, hey, here we are, right here. Oh, yeah. You know, it's one thing to be physically there, but it's another thing to be, like, completely present. This text that I, that I want to share with you from uh, John chapter 15, it, it goes into the deeper level of what it means to be in church, because we shouldn't let church be that place. We shouldn't let church be the place where we just kind of come and sit and go, okay, well, physically I'm here. All right, check that off the list. No, if, if, if you're not abiding in Christ and connected to Christ, then being in church in and of itself will bring you very little value. But here's what Jesus says about this. In John chapter 15, he says these words to his disciples as he's getting ready to leave them, ultimately. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands, and remain in his love. I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. 
and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. See, there's a lot to dig into there. And Jesus is not simply interested in what a person does with their body. He wants our body, soul, heart, and spirit all involved. <clears throat> and that's what constitutes abiding. To abide means a deeper level of connection. It's not just physically being here. You see, some people have attended church their whole lives, but have never faithfully really been abiding in Christ, have never been connected to Jesus. And that can't be what happens here. I'm reminded of the words of Jesus in Matthew 15, verse 8, where he says, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. We can stand and sing and, and, and all that, but if our hearts aren't given to Christ, then even our presence in church isn't really helping us. <clears throat> See, to abide is something different. First of all, it's a physical connection, and that's where the faithfully present comes from. A, a branch is physically connected to the vine, and it's through that physical connection that the branch receives all the resources it needs for life and for fruitfulness. The, the, the branch itself has no access to nutrients apart from the vine. And that's the imagery that Jesus is giving us when it comes to abiding in Him. He's saying, look, you've got to receive all of your resources for life through me. You've got to receive all of your energy, all of your, your power. It comes through me. Remember what Pastor Mike said last week. More, more, more prayer, more power. Less prayer, less power. We need that power, and that's where the abiding comes from. It comes from physically being connected. And, and, and we do that by coming to church. We do that by receiving communion. It's a physical act of saying yes to God and by offering our bodies to God in worship. There's a physical connection to that. Also, according to what Jesus says, to abide in Him means obedience. It means that we do what He says. It means that His words have authority to our lives. That we don't hear or read the words of Christ and go, well, you know what, that's just not really with the times right now. Or that's just not really fashionable. Or I don't really agree with that. See, we're called to be obedient to Christ. That's how we abide in Him. <clears throat> now many times people, people say, well, wait a minute, you, that scripture said that I can ask whatever I want from God and He'll give it to me if I abide in Him. That's right. If you abide in Him and are obedient to Him, then your desires will be matched up with His desires. And the reason why we don't receive what we ask for oftentimes is because we're not praying the will of God. Or we don't understand the will of God. But when we abide in Christ, we can be obedient to God even when we don't understand. And that's true abiding in Christ. And of course, his greatest command in this text was this, that we love one another. You see, Jesus said, the world's going to know that you're really my disciples by how you love each other. To abide in Christ has to mean that we love one another in the church. That we care for each other that we encourage one another, that we support one another, that we forgive one another, that we love one another. That's the point. And Christ gives us the resources to do that because I bet there's people in this room that are hard for you to love. I bet there's people even sitting in this room that without the connection of Christ, you would find yourself really struggling to love them. But because of Christ, you know, that, that hymn we sang, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Not just when the people that I really like get to heaven. It's when we all get there. That's when we rejoice. And because all of us are going to be there, we've got to learn, because we're going to be there forever, yang, to love each other. You need Christ to do that. And He can give you the resource to do that. Now, here's the other reason that abide means is, number four, fruitfulness will happen. When you abide in Jesus, you will bear fruit. And what that simply means is the evidence, the result of your faith. So ask yourself the question, how is your life different because you know Jesus? That's the fruit. You know, I talked to you for a little bit earlier about the great things that are happening around the church. That's the fruit of what God's doing here. A couple weeks ago at 412, we, we had as our... As our uh, <clears throat> Eighth graders were getting ready to graduate up to, to, to middle school or to high school. And by the way, I didn't know that there's a cultural thing now that kids graduate from every grade now. But um, 
and then our seniors were getting ready to graduate and, and move on. We, we just did this thing where we said we're going to have an open mic night for the eighth graders at the middle school service and then for the seniors at the senior high school. And that was a little scary. Just me handing the mic to a bunch of eighth graders and saying, whatever you want to say, say it. And I thought we were going to be hearing, you know, all kinds of irreverent bodily sounds or whatever. This and that, Because, you know, they, they can be a little squirrely. <clears throat> Any confirmation teachers in here right now? But, uh... What happened that night, and I, some of you were there, Kenny was there, and, and, and it was amazing, wasn't it, to hear so many students stand up, and I heard basically two versions of the same story. The first version was this. Before I came to 412, I, I never believed in God, and my parents don't go to church, so I never did the whole church thing, and my friend so-and-so brought me here, and this is kids talking to kids, <clears throat> and I got to tell you, it's awesome. God has changed my life. One young man got up and told the whole group that he's finally repented of his sin and that whatever sin he was involved in is nothing compared to worshiping God. I was just like, whoa. It was incredible. The, the second version of that story was this. I've been coming to this church my whole life. I've been doing everything. But when I come on Sunday mornings, I just sort of sit there and wait for it to get over. But after coming here and learning about Jesus, church is my favorite thing to do during the week. It was incredible to hear these kids saying that over and over and over. And I was just like, there's the fruit, the fruit of what God's doing. It's incredible to see that. And that will happen in the lives of people who are connected to Christ. Hey, if your life isn't changed at all because of your faith, then perhaps you haven't remained connected to Christ. Perhaps you haven't abided in Him. It's not just enough to physically sit on a pew and just be there. You've got to remain in Christ. You've got to stay connected to Him. Are we doing that? See, Jesus wants all of you but he doesn't want you to come here and get a little dose of Jesus and then run away, and then when you run out, come back for more. <clears throat> See, how many of you when you were kids played with those little electric train sets? Anybody in here? Okay, you had those. Those were pretty cool, right? I had one when I was a kid. I had a little mountain you'd go through, and I used to set my G.I. Joe guys up and run them over and stuff like that. It was pretty awesome. I'd get my sister's Barbies and, you know, do bad things to them with the trains and, you know... What was great about the electric train set was this. That thing was plugged into the wall, right? And the current runs through the track. So as long as, the, as the, the engine piece was on the track, that little train would run forever, wouldn't it? It would never stop. But if you'd get it going too fast and it would fly off the track, the second that it loses contact with the track, it's done. Okay? Now, I also had one of those. You ever play with those remote-controlled battery-powered cars? Those things were cool because they could go really, really fast. But the only problem with those things was, at least when I was growing up, they didn't la the batteries in them didn't last very long. So you'd charge up the battery, and then you'd go out and play with this thing in the street, and you'd trace your sister around with it. It was a blast. And, and, but it would only last maybe five minutes. And then you'd have to stop, run after it, and then plug it in and wait for it to, to, to get enough power to go again. You know your faith is kind of like that and being in church is kind of like that for some people. For some of you, church is, church is, is, is the thing that when you're connected to it, you never stop because God gives you the power and the resources to keep going. And that's the idea. That's what Jesus says when, when, when to abide and remain in Him, He'll remain in you. As long as you stay connected to Jesus, then there's no end to what God can do through you and in you as you stay connected to Him. But oftentimes, too many of us, we, we live our lives more like the remote control car, don't we? We get charged up. We come in from our, our crazy lives, and we get charged up with Jesus. We sing some songs. We hear a sermon. We see some people. And then we go out back into our world <clears throat> and try to live off that energy. And we can for a little while. Usually we can go really, really fast. This happens to kids at camp all the time. They can go really, really fast when they get back really, really fired up, really, really excited about what God's doing. But because they're not connected, they don't get very far. 
And then they just stop. Jesus said, remain in me. He didn't say, hey, come to me and get your, your, your power for the day and then go out. <clears throat> he said, remain in me and I will remain in you and you will bear much fruit. Folks, that's true for us personally. It's also true for us as a church. If we as a church remain connected to Christ, remain connected to the scriptures and to our vision, then there's no end to what God can do through us. <clears throat> but if we disconnect, if we disconnect, Jesus says, we can do nothing. So how a person abides through Jesus or abides in Jesus is simply this through responding to Jesus' call to abide in him. To, through responding to Jesus' call for salvation. He's put that call out there. He said, there's room at the table for you. He said, I have room on my vine for more branches. And he's looking to add more because he wants to bear more fruit. Should you join? If you're ready to say, I'm ready to be faithful in my presence, but deeper than that, I want to abide in Christ. You know what? You can do that here. You can do it anywhere. If you have another church that you're visiting from, go and abide there. But whatever you do, remain connected to Jesus. Don't separate. Don't disconnect. And watch the power of God come alive in your life. He's promised it would be that way. He chose you for that. And he'll do it. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for the fruit that we do see, God, but also for the fruit that we've yet to see. For the great works that you've chosen to do through us, God, we say thank you. And Lord, we ask today that you would instill in our minds and in our hearts a, a desire and a clarity to remain faithful to you, Father, and to remain faithful to our membership vows to be present. God, that we would recognize the importance of that and live it out. Lord, I pray for those who are struggling with that this morning, who feel like life is too busy, who feel like there are too many demands, who feel like there are too many pressures. God, I pray that you would shine your light of truth clearly to them in the midst of a clouded culture, Lord, that tells us that Sunday morning church is less than a viable option. God, I pray for revival to happen, Lord. I pray that the church would stand up against what this culture has told us, Lord, and that, Father, that, that organizations and activities would cease to function, God, not because they've decided it's important, but because none of the Christians are showing up anymore, because they're all worshiping God. But, Lord, in each of our hearts, you've called us, Lord, to a deeper level of abiding, and our prayer today is that we would see that true. Lord, help us to stay connected to you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen.